feet ground and made through Colombian hands. All right, next slide. Coffee is human fuel. That's what I steps in with our slogan, fueling the human body. I was about 1.4 billion cups of coffee is being poured on a global level. We're talking about a population right now of about 9 billion. So I had one out of nine people are drinking coffee on the daily. Here in the United States, here in my hometown, or even in Hialeah, or even in the city of New York, 400 million cups of coffee are being poured a day. That's more than the, than the population here in the United States. But not just how many cups of coffee is being drank in a country, but the highest capita and cultural is in Finland. 11 kilograms per person. We're talking, that's a lot. Because of the culture aspect of it, um, and even here in the United States, whenever you have a guest, you always usually offer them coffee or sweet. Especially in Nord Nordic countries where it's very cold, and even here in the United States and Canada, coffee is a, it's a great way, it's a natural stimuli that helps us warm our body and helps us be motivated. All right, next. And before, climate change. Um, as a young investor myself, um, climate change is going to uh, affect my generation, and that's as an entrepreneurship or entrepreneur, we we have to take this into the facts into our generation. So with that, uh, Colombia is currently the second growing country in the world and first in quality. That's why I picked Colombia, not just because my my mother is from Colombia and I've been to Colombia multiple times. But next slide. Next slide. All right, but to the zona cafetera, why do I bring up this particular zone in the, in the whole entire uh, world or even country? Why this? Well, with climate change, countries such as the west coast of Africa, Vietnam, and even in Brazil, which is currently the highest export, um, climate change will affect the, gro the growment of coffee because coffee is a very delicate bean in the process. As you see there, I was up close in person and I saw this opportunity when I visited Colombia. Um, the coffee beans. I, first of all, I thought it was a red grape, but it turns out it was not. And how cheap it was um, when I saw it on the streets and 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 a, a business opportunity. That's what I, I, I really saw. So, I, again, I saw this production high is working. So, with the zone, I really want to, with enough capital, eventually when we become an actual multinational company, this is where we want to start our operations. Because then, later on, we'll be the only uh, producer of quality coffee. Uh, next slide, please. Please, 21st century, the millennials, quality is preferred than quantity. This is where Ivy is able to do both, quality and quantity. And again, with the human population increasing, thus, even by 2050, another 2 billion people will be added to the global population. Then the coffee demand is increasing as well. Uh, next slide, please. Any questions? They don't see... Like, I can't see if anyone has a question, but uh, right now, if anyone has a question, please feel free to ask. Okay. Right, I'll get straight into it. All right. So what's the secret sauce? What's the, what's, what makes Ivy so special? Well, of course, it's going to be the coffee bean. As you can see here, I have actual beans homegrown from Colombia. I could clearly get a camera. See, these are the beautiful beans. These are what makes Ivy the company itself. This is what we're going to be making. This is what we're going to be exporting, as you can see here. And cultivated from, look how beautiful these beans are. I know uh, usually a lot of people just get the coffee drink, but I myself, beans is just how beautiful as you can see the products it makes. Any questions? Oh. But again, um, to, a little bit more about the magic as it increased. Right now, the coffee market is at $102 billion in 2019. And by 2026, uh, we, we're going to see a 6.2 increase in the coffee sector by $155 billion. So again, further to my point, the demand of coffee is increasing as well. Uh, next slide. But here's more about the business model of how Ivy is going to function. Here in the beginning, we have a, uh, a margin of about $14, uh, selling price of 20 bucks and $6 worth of materials and um, any fees that come, like such as shipping. Uh, we have a fixed expense of about $2,681. And we, with this expense, we only have to sell about 135 units, which is a one pound bag of Ivy coffee. 
I here I have a pure prototype of um, right now how I guess uh, coffee bags are gonna look like a whole pound bag with our logo as well. But um, we want to later on expand to with this investment initial investment we want to move on to six employees, which I'll further dive into in the next slides. Um, with office space as well here at headquarters in the United States, social media and our website, which are currently uh, on, on right now, but with maintenance and to keep it updated on a constant level with an e-commerce website. So we could get the opportunity, uh, since we know here in the 21st century, that online shipping and online buying is uh, increasing and is the my primary way of uh, buying products. And again, storage units will be incorporated in Columbia, so we'll be able to hold vast amount of units to be sold to either bulk, bulk units for companies um, and to private sales. Any questions? Well, again, what, what's the go-to market plan? Um, stores and brewing companies are gonna be our number one purchasers, uh, especially with bulk size, we'll be able to do like Starbucks, or uh, we'll compete against Juan Valdez Coffee, which is the current biggest uh, culinary exporting co uh, company in Colombia. So with ID, we want to be on par with them, but we're not just going to have our operations in Colombia. Uh, we look to further expand into other countries nearby Colombia, and then especially that Zona Cafetera, uh, which I want to keep on reiterating. And again, with our website, if you clearly see at the bottom left, um, that's the home page of the website, and to the right, you'll see. Um, that was the first day I post, uh, I created an Instagram account and we have 27 followers in just a couple of hours, uh, which is astonishing. Uh, next slide. Well, who here drinks Starbucks coffee? Anyone please raise your hand if you do drink car Starbucks coffee. Well, did you know that right now Starbucks is currently being held into account of child labor abuse laws or child labor abuse in Nicaragua and Guatemala? Well, that was Ivy. We want to create um, in the in the company a good working environment and proper treatment for workers. So not just profits, but again, we want to make sure that we're getting back to the community. Here again, in the millennials, um, they will support a company more that gives back to the community. That's what Ivy wants to do. We don't want to just make profit as an entrepreneur, but again, to get back to the community, because that helps us Ivy as well into expand onto operations. And organic, organic, that's number one right now is quality and organic. Um, it's better quality, it's better for us as a stimulus. What's ever grown from the ground is better not using GMOs, um, and especially by the farming community. And again, high profit margins, and here at the bottom you see a comparison between um, higher rated companies such as Black Box, Chamberlain Coffee, and you can see the price range. Our next slide. See, this is where, I, if you saw in the business model, I brought up six staff employees. I'm currently out the CEO and head of IE, and here if you see the six staff employees, this is where I want to treat Ivy, which it is going to be a multinational, international uh, company. So you can see here we have a European market executive, North American, Asian, African, Middle Eastern, and Australian market sector. So these vice presidents, they're going to be mainly into uh, their operations into these to these continents. So, for example, a North American VP will be, you know, focusing on our sales, um, advertising, and everything has to do in North America. So, this divulges um, not just the workload for, for one person, but it separates it so that each person, for example, we hire uh, Jose, who, who's a specialist in international relations, who studies in, in Spain and, and took classes, and he knows. Uh, countries of France and Italy and Germany, so he knows this territory. He knows how people, people would would uh, advertisement and cultural. That's what we wanted to do, cultural aspect. Uh, next slide. All right. So more about CEO. Who am I? How am I here? And a little bit about myself. I'm a world traveler, and why do I bring this up? Um, again, not just because I travel as it with my mother, but here, as you can clearly see in, this, in the picture to the right, that's actually in Colombia. 
So if you see my Colombian ad national, um, I, my mother's from Colombia, and I've been there multiple times again. But I, every time I travel, I see the opportunities that are in Colombia. Like again, Colombia, um, what it's a great opportunity to export coffee because that's what Colombia is really known for. And uh, when I went to Dubai in the Middle East with my mother, I saw opportunity, uh, and it, and I experienced it myself. When I had coffee, um, I preferred cold brew because it was so hot over there and the uh, humid not human weather, but very dry heat. So cold coffee came in really handy. So with this, this comes in the vice president of Asia, or the I mean, vice president of the Middle East. He's going to be focusing on this cultural aspect because then we could dive into the uh, providing the best means for cold brews. And from there, then we're going to be, we know what those people, uh, everyone wants. Again, advanced placement and doing Roman student current right now. I'm in a uh, senior year in high school, but I'm also taking courses uh, last year and this year with FIU. Um, and a dedicated, ambitious leader, as you clearly see here. You know, I've made it to the national pitch, and um, I'm very dedicated, man. Um, and I just love this company idea. I, I, it popped out of my head, and again, I want to thank Mr. Paris, who's here, who, who, who let me, who let my ambitious self uh, leads into creating in a, in a classroom an international company you know comparison to my peers who create like a dog walking company um myself i created you know a big go big or go home an international company and next slide oh this is my favorite slide and i got some investors this would you be off to your favorite slide um i like when i see when i see the graph going increasing um like then, coffee sector is it's expanding. With the human population, the demand increases. So, it's, and this again, it's um, it's one of our necessities. Stimulus. This is great for companies. Um, we again, we're looking into companies. Um, it's all our research is saying that when you drink a lot of cup, cups of coffee, you can even drink up to six a day, and it still be good for you. And this is just good for us because our gross profit and our initial investment, as you can see here at the bottom, um, what we need to 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 start off, to start up uh, Ivy. But even though those are big numbers and a lot of units, 3,000 units, how is he gonna s sell 3,000 units um, to pay back the initial investment or even grow the company? Well, as you saw on the Instagram page, what I wanna re reiterate is the 28 followers you saw. Well, if I get 30 more, which would equal 58 loyal customers to buy one bag of coffee a, uh, a week, which is about seven cups, if you drink at least one cup a day, seven cups, um, daily, uh, yeah, one cup, a cup daily, then um, you'll use a bag. But so for 58 loyal customers times 52 weeks, we're talking about 3,016 units. So I only need 58 people here in the United States or in worldwide to s sell just 3,000 units in a whole year. But then we want to expand that. We don't want to just sell 3,000 units. We want to go from 6,000 to 9,000 to 12,000, 18,000 expanding. So we want to go through a referral program as I brought up culture and Finland, um, usually when you offer coffee, and it's really good, like here in, in Miami, when you know they offer you un cafecito, um, you're like, wow, what what brand is this? And this is where the customer says, I see. And from there, we get a referral. It's like a ton of friends. And from that friend, if they go on that website and they start buying our coffee, then boom, another 3,000 units. And then this is our gross profit, which our net profit over those 3,000 units would be $51,000. From there, uh, next slide. I don't want to just brag off of future plans. I'll be currently attending Walsh U next year. I want to most selective countries in the school and, and especially in the Olin business, I uh, will be part of the Beyond Boundaries program. So I'll be able to both take international relations and um, the Olin business school. So again, to you, the investors, it's up to you. Uh, will you be pitching into the flourishing multinational company idea? Um, it's a lifetime opportunity. I guess we have 30 seconds. Well, well, thank you everyone for being here. Thank you so much, Joaquin, for that excellent presentation and thank you investors. We'll give you a moment to finish taking any notes. And in the meantime, audience, show your encouragement and congratulations to Joaquin in the chat. Cody, I'd like to interrupt for just one second, and if the investors have any questions, we'd like to give them some time to ask those, please, at this moment. Thanks, Suzanne. Oh. Hey, this is Evan Robinson. 
Um, great job overall. And I want to congratulate you on the job well done. Uh, my first question is going to be, this company is going to be really focused on marketing, distribution, and customer retention. Um, so in no particular order, can you just give us a little more insight in regards to how are you going to best put your organization to be successful in those three areas? Okay, well, right now I've been, I know with COVID in question, that's probably what brought up your question. Um, how am I going to expand right now? Um, I currently have family members and family friends in Colombia. So this is where I've been getting all my data from, not just Googling or oh, like, how much does this cost in Colombia? But I've been using actual uh, accurate data points um, from Colombians um, themselves. So they're tr giving me more data on how to be uh, more precise. And from there, um, with friends and peers, especially millennials and different age groups, I have Google Forms uh, being filled out with multiple questions. Um, and they were giving me feedback on how uh, customer relations, especially through different age groups to see how we could captivate them. Again, I, will, I keep on reiterating the use, how we drink a lot of coffee uh, because of stressful high school and even next year in university. Coffee helps us during exam week and everything. Um, this is where, where we want to go. Hopefully that answers your question. I know it was like three parts, but hopefully I did. Thank you. I have a question. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. So, so you walk us through this very exciting presentation, right? And then, and you're asking for our money. And then right at the end, you leave me with, I'm going to college. So it's up to you to take advantage of this opportunity. So you go to college, we give you the money, and then what? Have you thought about what happened? Great question. And um, I just, I know that my presentation had ended a little bit earlier, but um, to take off that note, when I do, when I did come into WashU, I brought up to this case, and I even talked to my teacher, Mr. Perez, who's currently here, um, how to continue this company idea. Um, when I be, when I'll be a thousand two hundred miles away from Miami, um, I'll be in in the city of St. Louis, which is an expanding international hub as well. So I'm not just going to like a rural area or just stay on campus. I'll be diverging into the city um, as an international hub and working with companies because Washington gives me an opportunity um, with CEOs and members in, in St. Louis. So I'll be able to take the, the company, the idea of Ivy um, and even get future VPs in St. Louis from different backgrounds, different, per, different perspectives in Washington as well. Thank you, so thank, you. Uh, thank you, investors. Um, before we move on to our next business venture, let's take a moment to hear from one of our nifty Chicago E2 alumni and national challenge finalists from 2018, Hassan Lipscomb. Hello, everyone. My name is Hassan Lipscomb, and I am a previous contender in the E2 competition. As such, I have a good idea of how some of y'all may feel about the competition. Some of y'all may be nervous. Some of y'all might have did it for the wrong reasons. Whatever the case may be, I want to congratulate you on making it this far. This is an important achievement in your life for you to make it this far. And y'all should take pride in that. But do realize that this is an opportunity to improve. And the most important thing about this competition is improvement. Winning is important. Don't get me wrong. I do want y'all to strive to win. However, the most important thing is to become a better person and a better entrepreneur. Because being an entrepreneur is all about taking control of your destiny. And Nifty is the best opportunity that you have to take control of your destiny. So, with that being said, I congratulate you. I wish you the best. And good luck. Hello. Hello. Such a wonderful yeah. message uh, for all of our challengers. Thank you so much, uh, Hassan. I'm excited to introduce our next student mm -hmm. business venture, Sown Earth. Founded by Ulysses Reveles. Welcome, Ulysses. Uh, you may begin. 
Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, if you uh, just uh, quickly, if you guys have any questions regarding the actual presentation or any questions about anything like what fast fashion is or what consumption is, uh, let me know. I'm I'm willing to answer anything. Okay. So there is no fashion on a dead planet. The fast fashion industry has created a problem that we must now solve. It is the world's third largest pollutant, damaging our ecosystem, environment, and carbon emissions. As a result, people have switched to slower fashion and are now consuming sustainable clothing. This, however, creates a dilemma for the consumer as they are now forced to pay more to limit their carbon emissions. That seems a little crazy to me, but I'm it's what girl, is done now. What so, where can you afford sustainable clothing at an affordable price? Here at Sewn Earth. Sewn Earth focuses on repurposing and restyling clothing found from thrift shops, consignment stores, and charity shops. We take the old clothes and make it new. Here at Sewn Earth, we believe in reusing, reducing, and restyling our clothing. Next slide, please. So, our problem or opportunity. 90% of clothing textile is thrown away in landfills. Uh, what does this mean? So I'm pretty sure we've all worn a t-shirt once or twice and it may be shrunk on us in the washing machine and we thought, oh, I'll just throw it away. It's no big deal. Or you have a few clothes after a closet clean out, a spring clean out, and you think, oh, I'll take it to go to a thrift store and get it donated. There, someone will enjoy it. Well, unfortunately, only 5% of the clothing donated to thrift stores is actually purchased. This accumulates to over 80 billion pounds of textile waste per year. This is a really big number. And if you can't, I mean, it's just, yeah, sorry. It's just a big number. Uh, many environmentalists want to limit their carbon footprint, but cannot afford new sustainable clothing as they are not accessible and they are quite expensive. Our target market are environmentalist and minimalist, specifically eco-minimalists that do not want to create unnecessary and unethically produced waste. Specifically, we're also targeting college and high school students as they live on a small income for buying and purchasing clothing. Here you can see through our surveys, I surveyed a few people that are in my target market and I asked them if they're willing to use thrifted and recycled clothing and they said yes. And then I, and about 90% said yes. And then I asked if they cared about limiting their carbon footprint and 70% said, yes, I do care about the environment and what I put into the environment. And a few of them actually didn't know what a carbon footprint was. So basically a carbon footprint is just when you purchase something, there were materials and resources used into that product. And it obviously leaves some, it, it obviously takes up consumption in the world. And that's something that is cannot really be destroyed as it is usually made of a plastic or a fabric that isn't uh, biodegradable. And after, after telling them that, a lot of them actually changed minds and said, well, yeah, I don't think that's a good idea and I would want to limit my carbon footprint. Next slide, please. So where do we come from? My business, Sewn Earth, recycles textiles from thrift stores, creating zero waste. The clothing is already made. There is nothing being made that adds on to the piling, piling waste at a landfill. My prices are affordable and accessible for all people of all incomes. And our clothing items are made uniquely and are one of a kind. So you know that what you're wearing, only you own. Our sizes also have a generous sign range of size double zero to a size 16, and we are actually looking to expanding more. Next slide, next slide, please. Our under my, uh, my underlying magic, I use high quality biodegradable materials. This means wools, silks, or any other fabric that is made naturally from the earth. And we, rep we repurpose this textile into modern pieces. Unlike other thrift stores that repurchase cloning and just sell it as is, we put thought and effort into repurposing fabric, giving it a new life. Next slide, please. So let's talk money. A redesigned shirt would cost me about $5, $4.46 to make. This includes the thread, the fabric, and any embellishments I want to add to my shirt. My cost of labor is typically $3, as it is just me taking my time and designing the shirts. That accumulates to $4.46 per shirt. And for my monthly, my monthly fixed expenses are $20. And this accounts for marketing, which would be campaign photos or any other small things I want to purchase and for the cost of my domain and website. So in one month, I'd have to sell five units to break even. Next slide, please. For a simple dress, which are our only two products currently a dress and a t-shirt, a dress would only cost me about, about $8.22 to make. Once again, this includes the fabric for the dress, the thread, and my embellishments. And again, I would be taking about $20 from my website and for taking photos and posting them on my website. And that accumulates to about needing 11 units to break even per month. Next slide, please. 
my go-to marketing plan. You cannot have a business if you do not market. So for our Instagram, I plan to use social media as my main resource as it's what's you, what's being used right now. Uh, we're going to have flash sales and discount codes to the people that follow us as we want to establish a relationship with them and get them to keep purchasing. We hope to generate about $10,000 in sale through Instagram throughout the years. For our returning customers, which is one thing that I really want to emphasize that we want to keep our customers and keep them purchasing from us. We want to repost their photos on our Instagram as an expression of gratitude for purchasing from us. And it's basically just my mission to create a friend-like relationship with these customers. And again, our goal is to have them come in for a second purchase. Now, PR, it's very important to get your word out through influencers and people that know what they're talking about. Uh, for PR, I personally plan to choose micro influencers that have a couple thousand subscribers, but have a long, have a credible impact on them. So for example, uh, obviously a YouTuber that cares more about consumption and ethical clothing production is obviously gonna be much more beneficial than per se a makeup artist. So that's the kind of public relations we're looking for. And this would be a key metric of 30% to raise our sales. Next slide, please. Our, my competitive analysis. I have Depop, Reformation, and Poshmark. Depop is, an, is a direct competitor as there are individual sellers that can practically sell any piece of clothing or anything really that they desire. This clothing is affordable, but it does have a limited variety as they focus on 80s and early 2000s clothing. For Reformation, it is, a, it is an indirect competitor as they are brand new and much more expensive. The clothing is new and made of sustainable fabrics. It is very modern and elegant, but you're basically paying about $100 per t-shirt. Poshmark is very similar to Depop in the sense that they have individual sellers where the clothing can either be brand new or used. However, they do focus more on, on um, brands such as Victoria's Secret, Pink, Adidas, Coach, and Michael Kors, which my personal uh, business isn't focused on that. It's focused on selling an array of clothing. So my competitive, competitive advantage would be that we're affordable. We're not just focused on vintage formal clothing, and our clothing is reconstructed to be a one-of-a-kind clothing item. And just to show a few... Uh, a few uh, statistics of how much the sustainability sustainability industry is growing by 2024 60 percent of major com uh, major companies will be forced to use ethically produced clothing so such as cotton hemp and those types of products that are much more sustainable and better for our environment the, the sustainable fashion industry grows by five percent every year and pretty much every month or so you're hearing of a new type of contest or something where people are limiting what they buy and where they buy it from next slide please my, my manager team. This is a one woman run show. Uh, once again, my name is Alyssa Ravellis. I didn't even I didn't say that, but my name is Alyssa. Uh, what leads me, what honestly led me for this business is that I not only care about the environment in the aspect of clothing, but I do care about the environment in every other aspect, such as the food industry. The uh, Even just something as simple as where you get your food from is super important as somebody has to grow that food. And obviously water is used. And all of that is something I am I am deeply uh, deeply into, as it's so important that we preserve and take care of our environment. My accomplishments: I was a second place winner of the Region Nine of the Region Nine Business FCCLA competition for my business Stone Earth, and I was also a finalist in the in the World of Innovations in Nifty. And my, qualification, my qualifications: I am an attendee of multiple workshops for entrepreneurship, offered in Compton Community College. I have been practicing and editing photos on my own as a personal hobby for about five years. And I have been practicing sewing for the past two years, which allows me to personally reconstruct the clothing and work on it whenever I can. I have taken art classes and a lot of online courses that teach me how to teach me color theory and ideas for how to present a well-structured campaign. Next slide, please. So for my financial projections, a redesigned shirt, once again, the cost is about $5.52 and I make about $10 on it. I did a couple of research and um, at the beginning of the year, due to the rush of the New Year's resolutions, many people have a goal of consuming less clothing and being uh, more conscious about the environment. So around the month of January, when people are you know thinking like, oh, new year, new me, new wardrobe. I think about that all the time. New Year is a time for buying new clothing and revamping, you know, my personal taste. And that is basically when a lot of people do buy clothing and a lot of people are focused on buying sustainable clothing. 
And another uh, high in our sales would be around September, as this is when kids and teenagers and college students are going back to school, so they will purchase more clothing. Next slide, please. For the for my redesigned dress, once again, the cost is $13.22 and the price is $15. We I estimate about the biggest sales being around September, as this is when the use of dresses is higher due to the summer. So obviously you want to be breezy, you don't want to be conformed. So you're going to purchase a dress. So, you know, it would just be a lot easier and it's a lot more sustainable for people to purchase. And that's just when it would be best for them to purchase a dress. Next slide, please. For my current status and future plans. My current status is I have a shop set up through my Instagram page. I am advocating on there as well of the reduction of clothing waste through my page as well, getting people, getting more people involved and knowing exactly what the consequences are of poor, uh, poor uh, production quality. And uh, just a few things about my current current status. Uh, due to COVID-19, I did have to limit my uh, production due to the fact that many thrift stores were closed. But now, since everything has you know gone a little bit down, I am able to start re repurchasing clothing and making it new. So then for my future status, my income made through sales has already been put back in and invested in improving my business. As one of the things I'm looking for is purchasing re is purchasing biodegradable packaging. So that's where my money has gone back, gone back to. For my short-term goals, I really want my goal to be 10 clothing items at least per month. And my long-term goals are to expand to have one employee by eight months. And that's actually a very long, a very big project of mine is I wanna get a young designer to just design me a few items and I can just follow the patterns and it will just be combining two young entrepreneurs trying to achieve their dreams. And uh, one of my biggest goals is also to donate to charity to the Network for Global Consumption, I think it's called. And basically in that, they focus on macro level sustainability. So for cities, for big schools, big towns, it focuses on making sure that their carbon emissions and their waste is lowered as well. Next slide, please. Once again, my name is Alyssa Ravellis, uh, CEO of CERN Earth, where we reuse, reduce, and restyle our clothing. Thank you. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask me anything. I am an expert at this. Well, uh, this is uh, John. Just a quick question uh, for you. Um, really liked your angle here on, um, I've got a couple of daughters that are similar age to you and Thank you. really like this, this type of clothing and thinking about the earth. I was particularly drawn to your go-to-market plan and some of your ideas around leveraging existing customers and having them reference and take pictures of them or return customers. And then also on the influ influencers where um, you talked about like micro influencers. So that's kind of a, I'm curious, like you talked about the 30% increase you thought you could get from influencers. Can you just talk a little bit more about how you think about that uh, and, and how you think 30% uplift is possible through, um, I think you call them micro influencers. Yes. So a macro influencer would obviously be someone over about uh, the margin is considered like 100,000 subscribers as their reach is a lot bigger than, say, someone that only has 20,000 subscribers. But someone that has 100,000 subscribers, their audience maybe just watches them passively and they're not such a strong fan and take what they say super seriously. Whereas a micro influencer that only has 20,000 uh, subscribers, their fans take them really seriously. They, they, they give them much more credibility. So through that, I'm hoping to reach uh, uh, influencers that are channels for sustainable clothing. And uh, I just, I honestly think that if they have their credible, which is what I'm looking for, their subscribers will trust them enough to trust me. And through that, I could sell the clothing to them. And if 10,000 people watch that video and only about three, uh, only about like 30 go in, that's already a big increase considering I'm only at 10 sales per right. month. Thank you. That's, if there's any other questions. Ulyssa, I would firstly just like to say, you know, an amazing presentation. I think this is just, just a wonderful idea. I noticed when you were saying about the sizes that it was going to go from double zero to 16. Now, is that that you're going to just be catering to the female or, you know, would I have a chance to potentially be buying some of your clothing as well? Uh, well, I mean, clothing has no gender, obviously. You can wear whatever you want, but specifically clothing catered towards men and suits. I personally don't have any experience sewing around men's clothing just because I don't have men's clothing. But 
I am looking to expand into selling uh, more pants and shirts, and that would be more gender neutral. So it would be for both, if that makes sense. Perfect, wonderful, thank you. Elisa, thank you so much. Uh, and investors, thank you. We'll give you a few minutes to make any final notes. And don't forget to show your support to Yulisa and Sone Earth in the chat. Before we hear from our last presenters, here's a message from Nifty Southeast E2 finalist from 2018, Elizabeth Berenger. Hi all, my name is Elizabeth. A little bit about me. I was um, the E2 competition winner in Florida in 2018. And later on that year, I went on to compete in Nifty's first ever E2 competition. These two competitions were truly these amazing experiences for a few reasons. Um, I was able to meet all of these wonderful people, both the Nifty staff members who became just this really valuable support system during this time and my fellow competitors who were passionate about their ventures in some sectors that I had never even heard of before, right? And I was able to have conversations and learn from all of these people, um, which is just wonderful. Another reason why I found all of this so valuable is that Nifty and the skills you learn through the E2 curriculum at least gave me the confidence to know that starting my own venture wasn't this outlandish idea, right? And it also gave me the confidence to know that my ideas were valuable and could make something great. On top of that, I was able to learn all of these skills at such a young age when many people go their entire adult lives without learning, gaining access to this information. So I just wanted to congratulate you all for the time you've put into your projects, all of the sweat and tears, all the hard work you're about to put in now at the competition. I am so excited for what you all have to offer and I wish you the best of luck. Thank you, Elizabeth, for that encouraging message. Now, our final business venture is Money Moves, founded by Samia Zia. Samia, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. My name is Samia Zia. And before I begin, I would like to just say to hold questions until the end. Thank you so much. Okay. Imagine being 15 years old in high school, going through your core classes such as algebra, geometry, biology, and then before you know it, you're 18, you've graduated high school, ready to move off into the real world. But then you're hit with, next please, bills, college debt, credit card fees, and you think to yourself that algebra did not prepare me for this. But lucky for you, I have a solution with Money Moves. Next please. Money Moves is a 3D life simulation video game and educational program that allows you to manage allowance, learn how to file taxes, how to pay bills, learn about scholarships and how to apply to college and much more. I plan to sell this game for $500 annually to school districts and educational agencies. So for the students who this game is really here for, it is completely free. Next. Okay. But now enough talking about the game. Let me show you how this game really works. Okay, if we can play the video super quick. Awesome, okay. So this here is Jake. He is a 18 year old senior in high school. And right now he is trying to save up for his college fund. So he actually managed to create his own babysitting business within Money Moves and managed to make $500 in just three weeks. So now he is going into the bank to deposit the money he made into his savings account, which will go towards his college fund. And not, you can not only just do that, you get to customize your own character in the game, spend, save, invest, get a job, as well as start up your own business, go to college, pay bills, learn about student loans, and you can even have all the fun of learning to buying a car and paying for car note, car insurance, and learn all about the amazing things that come with that. Next, please. And before I go on to the financial metrics, I wanted Money Moves to be a reflection of the real world. So I actually moved to the United States as a sophomore in high school. 
and I'm also a first generation um, college American student. So it's hard for me to kind of figure out on my own how to pay for student loans, figuring out how to apply to college, figuring out what credit is and getting a credit card for the first time. And as well as that, when I was actually a senior, I just graduated, um, my dad actually lost his job. So I had to kind of move out, live on my own at 18 um, and figure out how to pay for a room, how to manage budgets, how to save money enough to kind of survive. And when I taught myself these skills and went on this journey, I wanted to find a way to teach everyone else around me. And in a way that's gonna be fun for them in a way that they can actually remember this content. And I wanted to do this for people who are not just immigrants, people who are in similar situations as me, but just for 18 year olds in general, because honestly, this is key information that honestly, we don't even learn in school. And I didn't really learn much in school. So I wanted to give this opportunity to everyone no matter what background they came from. So I actually sell my game for $500 for one yearly game admission. My very room tier expenses are $50 with my fix being $51.25. My cost of goods is only $100. So I have a $400 contribution margin. And to break even, I only need to sell one unit monthly. Next, please. Okay, so my go-to market plan is direct pitching to schools and educational agencies. And with COVID-19, these can be done through Zoom and even in real life. Um, as well as this, I promote money moves through all my social medias. So I have Instagram, I have my website, multiple different resources because I really believe social media is our future. As well as this, I have another company called Zia Kids Learning, where I teach kids how to code and I implement money moves into this program where you, they can actually also buy it privately. And as well as learning how to code and how to code certain parts of my video game, they also learn about financial literacy. Next, please. Okay, so our competitors are EverFi and The Sims. So I don't know if you're familiar with EverFi, but it's a financial literacy curriculum that is currently embedded into the Miami-Dade County public school system. And I'm gonna keep it real, it's kind of boring. It's pretty much just watching videos about financial literacy and reading. And it's up to a point where my peers don't see much interest, don't show much interest in it until it's too late. And they're stuck and they graduate high school and they're like, well, what do I do now? So as well as this, EverFi does not educate on more than just financial literacy. It's not customizable to any ages, and it does not offer fun gameplay. My other competitor is The Sims. So even though on The Sims, you get to learn how to buy and sell and manage budgets, it is not really a good source to learn about financial literacy. It's not customizable to age ranges, but it does offer fun gameplay. But the best thing about Money Moves is there's currently nothing in the market like it. We educate on more than just financial literacy, where it's customizable to age ranges, offers fun game, gameplay, and so much more. Next, please. Okay, so I wanted to test if Money Moves was actually gonna be successful in educating the youth. So I assume that 30 kids that complete the game will score 80% on a section test that I give them after completion. And this was actually conducted in highly Miami Lake Senior High School. So on the, for the results, they got on average 100% in managing allowance, 80% in creating in business, and only 60% investing in stocks. So what I realized was that the investing in stocks language was too difficult for the middle schoolers to comprehend. So I simplified it for them and tracked my journey on my Instagram. As well as this, I think it's important that we teach the next generation about stocks, because I don't know if you guys saw everything about GameStop and AMC that was happening. A lot of youth were invested in tracking everything and wanting to know how the stock market works. So I provide a platform for them to do so. Next, please. And now that I was sure that my game is educational enough for the youth to actually learn, I wanted to make sure that it was fun for them to play and they had a great time and actually enjoyed playing. So with this survey, I asked them, how fun did you find the game on average from one to five? The average was four. Then I asked them what was fun about the game. They said that they enjoy talking to other players, collecting and spending money and exploring the map. And then I asked them, hey, what parts and features of the game did you not enjoy and why? They said that the map was too small and they wanted more customization options. So that's exactly what I did. I gave them a bigger map and added more customization options. And once again, tracked my journey on my Instagram at Money Moves Game. Next, please. Okay, now I will show you a testimony from a mother who's actually been using 
money moved to six months for their kids. Hi everyone, I just wanted to make a short video and tell you how much I have enjoyed working with the team at Zia Kids Learning and Money, Money Moves. They have been such a vital part in my kids' future and understanding financial literacy and making sure they understand taxes and understanding budgets and things like that of that nature. Um, I have a 13-year-old and I also have a 10-year-old and it's really important for them to understand financial literacy. You know, many times we don't teach our kids that. So as they get older, they don't understand how money works and this program this this program that was implemented by Zia kids and their team has been an amazing and vital part of my family it has really set my kids up um, for their financial futures and how to understand money and how money is made and how budgets are done so I've been using the program for my kids for a little bit over three months now and I cannot praise it enough I am very appreciative for such an opportunity to give to my kids to teach them. And I just want to tell the whole entire staff at Zia Kids and Money Moves, thank you so very much. Now, I appreciate that as a mom um, and also as an educator myself. This is something that every kid and every family should really, really, really learn how to do to better their future as they get older. And I want to say thank you guys for um, allowing me to be a part of that platform. Thank you so much. Bye. And that was a testimony from the amazing Miss Postel. Okay, now for startup costs. So the startup costs um, will be approximately 2,500, with programming costs being 500, graphic design being 200, server domain being 300, and marketing 1,500. And this is just for the most basic, simplistic version of the game that I can make. So for post-launch, I would like to expand my servers, expand everything, switch platforms also. So for programming updates, that'll be 1,000, graphic design 750, Switching platforms, $2,500, marketing $3,000 for a total of $7,250. So to get this game where I actually want it to be, I will need between $10,000 to $20,000 worth of funding because with video games, they're very complex to make and create. So we need a lot of startup funds initially, but however, later on throughout um, the course of over the years, it will not need that much money to keep it running, which is amazing. Next, please. Okay, so these will be my financial projections. So within a year, I plan on selling 275 units. This is just within the state of Florida alone. My gross profit will be approximately $137,500. My net profit being $134,615. With the initial investment being $2,500 for a turn of 154%. With the highest month of sales being at the beginning of the school years. Next, please. Okay, and this is my wonderful and amazing management team. So let me reintroduce myself again. Hello, my name is Sami Zia. I'm CEO of Money Moves. I just graduated high school and I'm currently attending FIU for economics. I've coded over five plus apps, video games, and websites, and as well as I'm CEO of Zia Kids Learning. And to my left is the wonderful Eric Prieto. He is a coder on Money Moves. He is currently in uh, Miami Dade College for computer science. He has coded 20 plus apps, video games, and websites. And then to my right is also the equally as wonderful, Mr. Freddie Rizzo, who is the marketing director here at Money Moves. And he's also in Florence National University for Business Administration. And he is CEO of Bosa's, which is another um, kind of video game that we have collabed on. So we actually met at Startup Summer, which I don't know if you're familiar with. It's another NFT program where we were actually competing alongside each other. And I'm not gonna lie to you, we were rivals. At first, um, we competed against each other. Um, we actually ended up placing first and second place because they were in a team. But that friendly rivalry just ended up turning to an amazing friendship and amazing business partnership. And we've collabed on multiple projects since then. And one thing that I'll say is that our team has and not many others do is passion. We love what we do. We're determined in what we do. And we actually believe if you don't love what uh, if you don't love what you do, then why are you doing it? So that's one thing that always keeps us running as a team. All right, next, please. Okay, at launch and now. So right now we're promoting money moves through our strategic marketing planning. We're pitching the schools and educational agencies. And as it's currently a PC game, we also want to put it on the App Store and Play Store. 
So for future plans, I want to teach more life skills throughout the game, not just financial literacy. So for example, changing a tire. I unfortunately had to learn this the hard way by being stuck on the I-95 with a flat tire, but I don't want anyone else going through the same situation. So I want to teach more generic life school and just how to be an adult kind of. And I also want to have different versions of this game for schools to suit different demographics of students. Because of course, some students don't learn the same way as other students. So I definitely want to adapt the game to suit the different demographics. And honestly, I want to get my degree. I want to get multiple different certifications with coding and just different ways I can constantly improve my business. Any opportunities to constantly improve, not just myself, my business also, is something that I'm looking forward to in my future. All right, next, please. All right, thank you so much for listening. This is Money Moves the Video Game, growing your mind a dollar at a time. And I'm open to questions. Hey, this is Evan Robinson. Um, if the investors were potentially to invest in you, can you talk about how funds would be used over the next uh, five months to a year? Okay, so the funds automatically will go towards the production of the game. Because although I have a sort of beta version running right now, I most definitely want to expand the game and add a lot more features as I was discussing um, throughout the presentation. So as well as the graphic design features of the game, it's also going to go towards kind of marketing and promotion. So going to schools directly, pitching to them, um, and similar concepts as to that. So that's where the money's mostly going to go. Thank you. My pleasure. Uh, I'm just curious. I saw that you're you're going to be charging five hundred dollars uh, for each of the schools to you know have this this program implemented. How did you come up with that number? Um, because I first looked at the how much budget the schools get to put into different programs, and they kind of range between depending on like how big the school is, one thousand to plus ten thousand. So I thought I'd like to keep it a reasonable number in the beginning, as I'm starting up as five hundred dollars annually. So, and then with this being implemented into school, see how well it does, slowly I would eventually, but plus with the 500 over the years, will eventually add up to more and more. Okay, thank you. Just, I had a similar question. So the 500 annually, so would it be additional 500 in the, in the upcoming year? Is that sort of kind of thinking ahead how you plan to progress or is it a membership that will stay stagnant? Oh no, yeah, so it's just a flat rate of 500 yearly. But hopefully okay. if it expands and I add more features and I will raise the prices accordingly. And then if an individual wanted to buy it, um, does the price change or if a an individual use was going to lo log in, um, is that possible and would it be the same pricing? Oh yeah, so how it currently works is um, they actually, when they purchase the game, they get like a login to the website. So that will be under their entire school and then they can add the children within the website and they give them their individual logins. But I actually don't, for right now, I'm doing it mostly just publicly because I believe that no kid should have to pay for the service. No one should have to pay for something like this. I feel like, cause especially from my background and where I'm from, I want to give this to everyone, no matter who you are, wherever, all schools, I want to be available to everyone. So private use, I'm not so kind of into that. Right. Thank you so much, investors. And thank you, uh, Sandra, very well done. Now, investors, if you could please leave the webinar with oh Paul my. and begin your deliberation. We'll oh see you in a little while uh, with your results. And let's not forget to congratulate Samia in the chat on her fantastic presentation. In fact, let's take a moment to uh, congratulate all of our E2 challengers. You are all incredible. Now that the investor panel has left, I invite everyone to join me in a close-up conversation with three of our Nifty teachers who teach the Entrepreneurship 2 course. In fact, two of them are in uh, are the teachers of our finalist business ventures here today. During our conversation, if any of you watching would like to ask a question about the E2 program, you can submit it uh, through the Q&A feature of this webinar. We can't promise to answer all of them, but we do appreciate you sending them along. With that, it's my privilege to announce uh, and introduce uh, Jessica Carruth, entrepreneurship teacher and business club advisor at Paramount High School in Los Angeles. Danny Gray, Nifty teacher and master educator at Thornwood High School in Chicago. And Ray Paris, startup tech and Nifty entrepreneurship one and two teacher who teaches digital media and uh, robotics at uh, Halia 
Miami Lakes Senior High School in South Florida. Welcome, Jessica, Danny, and Ray. Welcome. Since the Entrepreneurship 2 program is relatively new to Nifty, I wanted to spend a little time talking about what it makes, uh, what makes it special and how it differs from an introductory entrepreneurship class. I've got a few questions here planned and there may also be some questions from our audience. So um, let's see how this goes. So Ray, let's start with you. You've been with your E2 students for two years now. What kind of growth do you see from year one to year two? You know, I'm, I've seen my students, they grow as far as um, they're able to take the information and actually apply it to new businesses. Even though we start off with one business in class, a lot of times they'll come to me the next year, Mr. Paris, I have a new concept and I'm able to pivot the concept and use the principles that they've, they've, they've learned in um, E2 to kind of move on and, and grow their business in different ways. So yeah, it's, it has built a lot of um, confidence in my students moving forward. It's great to hear. Uh, Jessica and Danny, have you seen this to be similar in um, your uh, education of the program? Yeah, definitely. Um, a lot of students have great ideas at the beginning, but what I love about the entrepreneurship program is that it embraces creativity and it allows students to think outside the box and not be afraid of trying things new or changing it up. Um, a lot of students in the year one program are very fearful to make changes, modifications, um, and li little by little, they start to learn that it's totally okay, that pivoting, making, um, uh, thinking of different ways to do things, innovation is welcome. So you do get to see how the students de develop their, their um, confidence and they lose their fear to be adventurous and, you know, just dream big. And I can probably say that the students in E2 understand the entrepreneurial mindset a little bit better than they did in E1. So as Ray said before, they're getting more involved with the activities. There are great activities embedded in E2. And these students are just more confident. They're just more confident from the intro class to the to the advanced class. They just kind of know that they want to be entrepreneurs. Confidence seems to be a, a running theme uh, across the E2 program. Um, I'm curious, Jessica, what do you do to prepare your E2 students to do an investor pitch to build that type of confidence? So in my class, we focus a lot on uh, networking, rela relationship uh, building, um, we have a lot of fun with the elevator pitches. Um, public speaking is a great fear for not only students, but adults as well. And I do invest a big portion of my class time practicing public speaking and just letting go of that fear and that shyness, um, which I tell them at the beginning, hey, it's okay to be scared. It's okay to be shy. It's okay to be embarrassed. But um, I do, um, create a welcoming environment and a safe environment in my classroom where it's okay to make mistakes. Um, and uh, feedback is also something that I give my students um, throughout the entire course um, for every assignment. I just try to give my genuine feedback. And then I teach my students also to accept feedback because that's also a skill that not many people um, have or at least not at the beginning uh, receiving feedback can be tough especially when it's feedback that perhaps you don't want to hear um, but I do see that my students start to develop that that um, um, they want feedback they ask for feedback and then um, we do a lot of recording um, so we do I do encourage my students to record themselves while they pitch so that they could see their body language, so that they could see their pacing, the speed of their of their pitch, and then they make modifications and they give themselves feedback um, other than receiving the feedback. So a lot of um, self-reflection um, is something that I do in my classroom and that definitely um, helps my students kind of practice um, and also I encourage them to participate in multiple 
um, competitions, uh, speed, uh, fast pitch competitions. Just apply everywhere. Try to pitch as 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 much as you can, and then they get that that uh, they develop that muscle so that they're able to just you know this is just another one of those practices. Do what you have been doing, and you know you'd be great. <laughs> Danny Ray, is there anything that uh, you'd like to add and how um, the both of you prepare your E2 students? I would I would say just just practice, 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 practice. My students are pitching in front of teachers. They're pitching in front of other students. Uh, you know, they're pitching on video and then they're getting feedback about the video. Uh, I remember I also teach our uh, summer camp. And I remember one time my E2 students were actually in the school. I teach the camp on another campus in Chicago. My students, my students were actually at the school calling me saying, Mr. Gray, we're in your classroom practicing our pitch. So practice, practice, practice is, you know, what makes them better and just develop into better students that can, you know, just pitch in front of an audience because they're just a little bit nervous. So it's all about, you know, practicing and getting feedback and just making themselves better. I just throw in real quick. I I would say um, I do a lot of energy and sporadic. Um, I get a lot of guest speakers to come in, um, and I just I keep a lot of energy in the room, so they don't know what's gonna happen. Um, I call on my kids. I have guest speakers that come in. I have teachers that drop in the room and say, "Hey, could you tell me your, about your business?" So they're constantly talking and sharing that um, and taking risks. So one of the key things I try to implement is the entrepreneurial mindset which is um, flexibility, being able to be adaptable. Um, those key eight domains are critical um, for our students. And right off the back, I said, this is the key to making it in the real world. Those eight domains, entrepreneurial mindset. That's about it. Cool. Um, so in thinking about the pitch, uh, Danny, can you actually talk about um, your students' pitch process? Um, specifically, how do you see the pitches evolving from uh, E2, E1 to into E2? Well, from E1 to E2, I can see some of the students that were in E1, they didn't have as much confidence. They were not as, they didn't practice the entrepreneurial mindset as well as they did when they, when they took the E2 class. I can say in E2, they're a lot more confident. Uh, they've kind of validated their business ideas because there's so much marketing research that's embedded in E2. So by validating those ideas, that gives them a lot more confidence in the E2 program. And these students are just more serious about starting their businesses. By the time they get to E2, they've taken that class because, you know, they had fun in E1, they learned some things in E1, but they weren't sure, in some cases, even what an entrepreneur was. And now they know what an entrepreneur is. They know all the opportunities in entrepreneurship. Now they're actually ready to start those businesses. So they have that confidence. They've, they've validated that idea. And now they're ready to get out there and take those risks and actually be entrepreneurs. Um, and in thinking about sort of that, the next step in being an entrepreneur, uh, Jessica and Ray, you, you taught the students who pitched here today. So uh, congrats for, for working with them. Um, as a next step, can you share with us what you think their next steps uh, will be uh, towards working uh, on their business and towards their business launch? Well, I'm going to. Oh, I know, uh, you, oh, sorry. You can go ahead. <laughs> So I know Yulisa is really passionate about her her business idea. So definitely, uh, whatever happens today, she's gonna continue on just developing and those skills. Um, and she's just a. Uh, uh, I've seen her grow. I she started in my class as a sophomore, and I saw her just grow from very shy tenth uh, grade student. Um, a little bit reluctant to be in front of an audience, but definitely open-minded and uh, willing to grow and learn. Um, so I could just see Elisa just continuing on with that trend of her just um, embracing uh, learning and uh, embracing adventure and um, developing this uh, this idea, which um, you know she knows now that. You know, little by little, it's all the little steps that count. And um, this is just one of those, uh, another milestone for her to just, you know, catapult to to her future endeavors. Um, so yeah, I, I'm so proud of her. Super, super proud of her. Mm -hmm. 
Um, for me, um, it would be their next step with Examia and Joaquim. I think it would be more to learn, um, gain more life experience out there. Um, I keep telling them, telling my students to have a circle that is that can bring you back re re rewards. You know, build a team that that can, can that can add value moving forward because they're in the learning stage right now and they need to be more open because I keep telling them, hey guys, your business is going to change. It's going to pivot, be open to new things, and also move with its, move with time. Move with the times that we're in. See things that's happening, be able, be able to adjust, pivot, and continue that vision because what you start today will be something totally different tomorrow. So, yeah, I think they're on, they're on a good track. Cool. So, um, Danny, you've been teaching Nifty for a pretty long time. And actually, I guess this is a question for both you, um, Ray and, and Jessica as well. Danny, what do you think is the, the special sauce, uh, so to speak, that makes Nifty's approach to entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship education, uh, and in particular, uh, activating that mindset, that confidence uh, that all of you were, were talking about is uh, what's been successful for you uh, using the Nifty curriculum as a tool to activate that. Well, I can say for me, my successes came from just my ability to customize the curriculum. I mean, the curriculum, I've taught accounting, I've taught marketing, I've taught intro to business. There is no curriculum out there as good as Nifty's entrepreneurial curriculum. I mean, it's by far the best. I can do my own thing. I can have a dance competition where I can do an old school dance or I can play in a band with one of the activities. I mean, this curriculum allows a teacher to have energy to do their own thing. And if you can't be a successful teacher teaching Nifty, then you probably shouldn't be a business teacher. I also can say my dad was an entrepreneur. My dad had businesses back in the 70s. He had multiple businesses. My dad got his GED. He didn't go to college. He had five or six different businesses. And I often think about as a teacher, all the things my dad could have done had he had this curriculum when he was in school. All the things my dad could have grown to had he known about opportunity recognition or the economics of one unit or marketing and promoting the business. My dad didn't know those things and he was still a pretty much successful entrepreneur. But with Nifty's real world experiences embedded into the entrepreneurial curriculum and allowing the kids to practice the entrepreneurial mindset, it's just an amazing curriculum to teach. And the secret sauce is just a teacher that takes it and makes it their own and does and does their own thing. Yeah, I, I have to agree that uh, the curriculum is awesome. I mean, it includes tons of ideas, a lot of lessons and activities where it allows the students to just uh, build these skills. So even if they don't have too much creativity at the beginning of the course, these activities, the lessons um, allows them to build creativity and allows them to kind of go back to the time back in their childhood where it was okay to play. And it's it, it really um, it really does infuse that that creative mindset and um, open minded open mindedness. And, um, but I also have to say that part of the secret sauce is the team effort. So I have to say that I have an awesome team, both at the district level, at the site level. And then um, I have the director of curriculum, uh, Kenny, and it's just, it's a, it's a great team that just kind of, everybody's in the back end coming up with different ways to expose our, our, our students with enriching um, um, experiences, like going to, different competitions having guest speakers join our classroom and it's just uh it's just a different class it doesn't even feel like school it feels like like a, a like a community of of entrepreneurs just joining to develop these dreams in 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 a classroom so i just i've loved my experience and i've loved working with the students and with everybody part of the entrepreneurship team in paramount mm -hmm. uh, for me uh, I would have to say it's that PBL, that project-based learning, hands-on, um, this real-life experience. Uh, one of the key things that I thought 
that 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 is a secret sauce is that nft tends to bring the real world into the classroom they tend to bring um, real entrepreneurs who are doing it to speak to our kids and i think that speaks volume um the curriculum is adaptable it's very flexible which is pretty good um the support the support and the family you know sometimes a lot of programs give you the, su the support but guess what you're left out there to figure it out nephi has a system that allows you to build support and grow as a teacher and also with your students um the key thing that i love is the fact that nephi gives back um in underserving com communities um the emi i think is a very essential sauce secret sauce the entrepreneurial mindset and also in these times of COVID, how Nefty was able to pivot uh, with the online canvas um, is also a secret sauce that my kids are actually um, adapting to in these times that we're in now, right now. So that's about it. Thank you, teachers. Um, and in thinking about the question from, um, from an alumni perspective, I almost think this is a trick question. What's the special sauce? Uh, quite honestly, if you ask me, the special sauce is all of you. Um, I still remember my nifty teacher, uh, Kenny, um, I still talk to him, you know, 15, wow. 16 years later. Uh, and so as much as, you know, the curriculum and all the project based learning is great in the curriculum, uh, but I just want to highlight that actually it's all of you, um, uh, that, nice. that is the secret sauce and the special sauce, uh, for Nifty's curriculum. Beautiful. So it looks like our investors have returned from deliberation. Uh, and that's our last question. Thank you again. Uh, Jessica, Danny, and Ray, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me. Um, I've learned a lot. I'm sure everyone else has too. Um, I love to go back and take an E2 class with all three of you and my nifty teacher. Uh, audience, please show our awesome teachers some love in the chat. Thank you, Cody. Thank you. Great. So um, welcome back, investors. We're excited to hear how the uh, prize pool of fifteen thousand uh, dollars will be invested before the final decision is announced uh, we'd like to provide a few moments to each of you to provide any final feedback or support you may have for our presenters um, any feedback is appreciated, uh, but it looks like a lot of you actually offered it in the chat. So um, I'm happy to jump in, Cody. I'm happy to jump sure. in. So hey, everyone, this is Evan Robinson again, a Nifty alum. I just want to say uh, you all did fantastic jobs. We had great deliberation just now in the judges room in regards to how we were going to distribute the funds as investors. One of the biggest things I want to point out this evening is that you know, whether how you rank this evening, we want you to take away the core concept of the entrepreneurial mindset and these transferable skills that you all have been able to acquire over the last few months, weeks, however long the program has been. Um, whether you're going to continue to run the business, go off to college, run the business while you're in college, et cetera, et cetera. These are all core foundational skills that can be applied to any educational, entrepreneurial, or business uh, area that you go into. So we really want to stress that. And we want to stress the importance of this community, the nifty community of supporting each other. Um, not to say a lot, but we, we were really impressed by your, your work ethic and the energy that you all brought into the virtual environment tonight. So congratulations again. I'll just add as well. I, I get the opportunity to sit down with a lot of entrepreneurs in my in my day job, and you each each and every one of you were extremely impressive in your presentation skills and your confidence in your business, which quite honestly becomes one of the most critical skills in in the working world and life and in entrepreneurship. And so I think do what you keep doing, do what continue to do what you're doing right now. Um, you were all very impressive, and your ideas are going to go a long way. Thank you, Evan and Noel, for sharing your feedback. Um, at this time, I'd like to invite Nifty's CEO and president to join me once more to announce the decision from our investor panel. JD? Cody, thanks so much for giving all your time to be with us tonight. It's great to spend time with our remarkable Nifty alumni like you. Everyone, please take a minute right now and show your appreciation to Cody in the chat. Thanks so much. And another round of thanks is also due to our incredible VIP investor panel. 
thank you so much for being here. Your time and especially your questions and your thoughtful uh, feedback means a great deal uh, to our students and also to us at Nifty as a whole. And so now, the moment we have all been waiting for, it gives me great pleasure to announce the results of our first investor pitch challenge. The winning business venture from this challenge is Samia Zia with Money Moves Woo! receiving $9,000. Congratulations, Woo! Samia. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Woo! Congratulations. Thank you so much. I'm overwhelmed. Thank you so much. Okay. And I'm not done yet. Next, with Sone Earth, Ulyssa Revelis receives $5,000. Thank you. Lisa, congratulations. Well done. well done. And finally, Joaquin Otero with AGRI receiving $1,000. Congratulations to you, Joaquin. Thank you. Congratulations, Challenger. You all did a great job. And enjoy the investment that is coming your way and all the advice and support you've received from the judges tonight, your mentors, before and going forward. Back to you, Cody. Thank you so much, JD. Um, at this time, I think that concludes uh, tonight's program. Uh, thank you, judges. Thank you, investors, uh, especially the teachers and also uh, the students. Everyone have a great night. Thank you again.